started now. So welcome everybody to this wonderful event. Um, this event has been mainly been organized by uh, volunteers from across the globe. Uh, that is the Agile Tony Reflect Festival. And this festival has brought all Agile practitioners from across the globe to share knowledge, um, learn and relearn, and celebrate, actually celebrate the Agile Manifesto, which is um, 20 years now. And um, different um, communities have different events. And this event is um, being run by me, Shimonya Kabunda, and uh, Billy Mwape from PMI uh, Zambia chapter. So Billy, maybe you can tell us a bit about uh, PMI um, Zambia chapter, and then we can introduce our wonderful host, um, Scott Ambler. Um, the disciplined uh, Agile Chief Scientist. So, Billy, over to you. Thank you very much, Nchomonya, for that great introduction. Indeed, we're very excited to have all of you attend this meeting, and most importantly, for SCORE to find time. PMI Zambia chapter was recently fully chartered this year. I was joking in, in the preamble of our meeting that it's a COVID-19 baby. And this is one of our initiatives that we've embarked on to our monthly webinars to enrich our membership with knowledge. And in today's presentation, we're going to have Scott Ambler who will be fully introduced by Inchimunya. We are very excited as a chapter to have you. I am the vice president for PMI Zambia chapter. And on behalf of our board, I'm very excited to have you. And I look forward to us working together going forward in changing the way we do project management. And now throw back to Nchimunya to give a bio of Scott, and then we jump right into it. This will be an interactive session. We are going to have a kind of interview with Scott and just dig deeper. Feel free to take notes. And for questions, quickly use the chat box to just drop your questions and we'll read them out to Scott. And you may want to mute yourselves for us to manage this session properly. Thank you very much. Back to you, Nchimunya. Thank you, Billy. So um, Scott Ambler is the Vice President and Chief Scientist of D Disciplined Agile at Project Management Institute. Scott leads the evolution of Disciplined Agile to Kit and is an international speaker. Scott is the co-creator of the Disciplined Agile Toolkit as well as the Agile Modeling and Agile Data Methodologies. He is the co-author of several books, including Choose Your Wow, an executive guide to the Discipline Agile Framework, Refactoring Databases, Agile Modeling, Agile Database tech Techniques, and the Object Primer third, third Edition. Scott blogs regularly at projectmanagement.com and he can be contacted via pmi.org. So Scott, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So, so first of all, um, happy anniversary or happy birthday to uh, the Agile Manifesto. This is, uh, the, as we all know, the, the 20th anniversary and uh, it's, it's been an incredible ride and will continue to be incredible. So uh, yeah, what I want to do is just throw a few ideas out there, and then you know, as you heard, we're gonna we're gonna open up the questions. Um, I've got some slides, and you know, I may or may not refer to the slides. Who knows? But um, the it depends on the questions. So, anyways, so uh, a few a few things. So, what's Dispin Agile? Uh, so, Dispin Agile is a toolkit, not a framework. And the and that, that's a, a very different proposition than what you might be used to. So where the frameworks uh, provide, you know, good ideas and um, they, you know, they solve a certain problem. Uh, so for example, Scrum solves a certain problem, Safe solves a certain problem, Less solves a certain problem and so on. Um, and they, they have a good solution to, to, to solve that problem. Um, a toolkit is different. So instead of telling you what to do, instead of telling you, hey, here's a, here's a collection of best practices and this is the official way of working, instead what we do is 
uh, the DA toolkit puts practices and strategies into context because we recognize that people are unique, teams are unique, and organizations are unique. So as a result, the um, you need to have you want to have a fit for purpose way of working. You need to ha you have your own way of working, and this is observably true. Like if you you know, walk into an organization, you can see different teams and they'll, be all, they'll all be working in different ways and because they're different people and perfectly fine. So let's embrace that. Let's celebrate that. And um, I would argue this get in many ways gets back to some original philosophies in the Agile community, one of which is that teams should own their own process. Teams should be allowed to choose their way of working they should be allowed to evolve and you know, experiment and evolve their way of working. So as, as they learn, as their situation changes, so should their way of working. They should always be striving to get better. So let's enable that. But the thing is, um, we need to go beyond the rhetoric stage, right? Like this is, you know, it's always been rhetoric in the agile community of, oh yeah, you can own your own process and good luck. You're smart, you can figure it out. And yeah, you know, you are smart and yes, you can figure out, but it's really hard. It's a lot of work and it doesn't need to be that hard. It really doesn't. Um, but you also need to, the challenge is you need a little bit of humility to understand that yes, even though you are unique and you face unique challenges, other unique people have solved similar challenges in the past. And as a result, you can leverage their learnings. You can stand on the shoulders of giants. If you know about these techniques, if you know about these strategies, and more importantly, if you know what the trade-offs are, because there's thousands of practices out there. So how do you choose? And so this is, this is what DA helps you to do. We help you to understand, here's, what you, here's the, the challenge you actually face. Here's what you need to be thinking about. And here are your options. Here's how you choose the right techniques for you. Um, of course, we give you, you know, starter, you know, starter things, you know, we describe life, different types of life cycles to give you a start and, and good things like that. But what we really want to do is help you, is help to teach you to learn how to actually improve. Because, you know, one interesting thing, um, you know, if you, if you step back and you ask yourself, what organizations do I admire? You know, what, what companies would I want to work for? Or what companies am I scared to compete against? Like, you know, if I had to compete against Amazon, would my company survive? Um, probably not, right? So, and, and, and so this is the challenge. So I'm a firm believer, like, so look at the, these companies like Facebook and Amazon and Google and Netflix and many others. Um, some people call these the fangs. Um, I like to refer to them as the apex predators. Right. These are these are, you know, these are the, the companies that are on top and how did, because they're really good. How did they get so good? Well, they chose to get good. They chose they didn't go off and adopt a bunch of frameworks and just do what they're told. They wouldn't be competitive that way. Um, you know, yeah, that might that could help them in some cases, but it wouldn't make them competitive. You know, what they actually did was they improved in small steps. They followed a, a continuous improvement technique called Kaizen where you know, a bunch of small little changes add up over time to really big changes, to really big effects, which is, and because you know, Amazon's been doing this for 15 or 20 years, they're incredible. They, you know, they, they are a truly competitive and you know, uh, very, very competitive company. So, and they did this one small step at a time. So in DA, we're helping you to do that and actually do it faster um, because the challenge for the Amazons of the world is that they're on the leading edge. So they're dealing with brand new unique problems because uh, just because they're so good, that's what happens. Um, you aren't that good. <laughs> so you can actually leverage their learnings um, or if you choose to. So I think that's, uh, and, and we help you do that in DA. So anyways, uh, and, and just to, before, yeah. So as you, as you heard, please start typing questions in. Um, but the, so from a, a project management point of view or, uh, and you know, portfolio management, program management, all that good sort of stuff, um, there is obviously space for project management in the Agile community, um, but it's a different flavor than we see in the traditional world. Um, it's collaborative, it's respectful, it's humble, it's um, focused on quality. So um, it has a different mindset. So the, 
challenge, particularly for more traditional managers, is you know how do they change their mindset to fit in? Um, but I would also argue um, how you know what value do project can project managers bring, which is and it's a lot, to the agile community, and and how do they how do they bring these great experiences they have and these great techniques that they know and uh, apply them in an ad, you know when appropriate to the extent appropriate in an agile manner. And you know, this gets back to what we do in the toolkit. Um, we're not limited to Agile in Dispin Agile. Dispin Agile is hybrid. So we've adopted great ideas from Agile, from Lean, from, from traditional, from, from other sources, including the PIMBUC guide, including ITIL, and in, including COVID, and, and many you know, sources that would be typically considered um, really, really traditional. And we've managed to pull the nuggets out and um, put them into context because there are some great ideas in the traditional world. There is some very good ideas there. Um, so how do they fit in? When do you do them? So I think, I mean, um, obviously there's great ideas in Agile and Lean as well. So um, choose the right strategy off the shelf for the situation that you face. Um, so that's our, our philosophy and data. But anyways, let, let's open it up to questions and we'll, we'll see where the conversation goes. Okay, thank you very much for that great introduction, Scott. I will ask you two leading questions before we can move on to my core host and then we can get to the chat. Interesting how Agile gives us the ability to actually apply it contextually and it gives us the leverage to learn from others. I have not noticed from the trend that Agile is, has been implemented majorly in the software development discipline. I'd like to pose this question to you from your massive experience in transforming teams. Do you think that Agile can be as effective and efficient in business projects as well as construction projects as it has been in the software development project? Yeah, absolutely. So the so that's a great question I, and I get it all the time. The so we need to remember that Agile came from the software world. So it's not the Agile manifesto, it is the manifesto for Agile software development, right? So, um, you know, and we shortened it to Agile manifesto, but the, so it came from the software world and the, the goal was to address the problems uh, that the software community faced 20 years ago. Um, many of those problems have been, ha have actually been solved in part by the Agile movement in part by other things, but, um, so anyways, Agile came from software. So as a result, it's being applied in the software world a lot. And, you know, as you'd expect, um, but it's also being applied elsewhere. And, uh, you know, it's being applied in business. It is being applied in construction. So for example, I'm at, I'm at my cottage right now, north of Toronto. Um, and this house was built in a hybrid manner. Um, we actually started with a traditional approach and which you would think would have worked. Um, and it didn't. It, it, we ran into tr serious trouble and we actually had to rethink the um, project manager that uh, had started it. And um, we ended up going to a, a more hybrid approach in order to actually well, finish, finish the job as well as to evolve, um, evolve the work because our, our needs evolved throughout the, the term of the project. So it, it ended up being a hybrid approach. Um, also in Toronto, where you know I normally live, the uh, we recently built a hospital using a hybrid agile approach. So keep in mind, you know, this is a hospital, right? So you know there's significant regulation, and it's Canada, right? So it's there's significant regulation. Um, there's very significant environmental problems. You know, before we started, I was talking about how where I live, we have about a sixty degree you know, 50 to 60 degree range in temperature throughout the year. So right now, this morning, it started at nine, minus 25 Celsius. And in the summers, um, where I am, it'll get into the mid 30, you know, low to mid 30. So that's a pretty big range. So when you're building things, you got to be able to handle that big range. And so there's a lot of regulations. So so anyways, the the frame the of the hospital was built in a in a traditional manner, um, as you because you know, regulations and engineering and laws and good stuff like that. Um, but the floors were actually designed on a just-in-time basis to reflect the technology, you know, to reflect the needs of the community at the time, as well as the uh, medical technology, because medical technology is evolving at a very rapid pace. 
plus this hospital is in a part of the city that is growing rapidly. So Canada grows through immigration. Uh, we pick up over a quarter million people a year uh, or more through immigration. Many of them come to Toronto. So Toronto is a very vibrant and multi multicultural city. And it's phenomenally difficult to predict and plan um, what's needed um, because you don't quite know, you know who's gonna be here next. Um, so um, who's gonna be living in this neighborhood you know, next year? Um, who the heck knows, right? Um, what are their needs gonna be? Uh, so, so for example, a few years ago, uh, we picked up a lot of Syrian refugees. There's some, you know, there's some very different needs for that group of people than for other groups of people, right? So, so fair enough. So anyways, um, so that's a long winded uh, answer to yes, you can do construction in an agile manner, but it's, it's a hybrid manner, right? You can be as agile as you can be in the situation that you face. So obviously building a hospital, there's some limits. Um, to how agile you can be there, right? Versus building software, it's much more flexible and much more dynamic. Um, and as far as the business question goes, um, the answer is also yes. So, um, so you know, so in, in the in the DA toolkit itself, um, we we organize it into what we call process blades. Um, there's 24 process blades. One of them is Dispin Agile Delivery, which is software development. Um, several others are very technical in nature because they they make up DevOps, uh, the, you know, the Dispin DevOps layer. But many others are affecting the business layer. So things like finance, um, marketing, sales, um, vendor management, procurement, uh, people management, HR, um, you know, so and, and, and portfolio management, uh, many other enterprise architecture. So they're more businessy in nature than they are software development in nature. So, uh, and the point is, is that, but in all those blades, there are some traditional strategies, there are some lean strategies, there are some agile strategies so you need to so you your finance team can pick the techniques that make sense for your for you know for their situation whereas my finance team will pick another set of techniques and another way of working for for their situation because they're different people facing different things now there's great overlap of course but um certainly you know certainly they're 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 still different and, and and they have different levels of knowledge different cultures different you know, preferences uh, different way, you know, just different uh, preferences for the way that they work and the way that they think. Um, so they'll be, uh, you know, they're, they're going to work differently and rightfully so. So, so one, one process size does not fit all. Um, you, you really need to be flexible and develop a, a right, uh, like a fit for purpose process for you. And that will change over time. Thank you very much, Scott. I like how you've touched on the aspect of hybrid. There's another school of thought that says, it's either waterfall or hybrid uh, or agile. You can't do it both. But I like how you bring out the practical examples of those projects at the hospital that has actually yeah. worked. That is actually, brilliant. I want to be addressing that, um, the purists. I want, to, I want to send a message loud and clear to the purists. That is complete and utter nonsense. You need to stop it. It's just ignorant. It, it's really ignorant. Um, you know, for those of us who, who can remember back an entire year, I'm sure you, I sure, you know, this is a bit of a hot button for me, but um, I'm sure you can remember there was a lot of agile coaches that running around telling you, you can't be agile when you're on a remote team. I don't think there's a single person on the planet that would share that nonsense now. It was nonsense back then. It's certainly nonsense now. Um, and, I, and I say the exact same thing to the traditionalists. Um, I have never, ever, ever seen a situation where you couldn't become more effective, when you couldn't become more agile and more lean, ever. Uh, and I've seen a lot of people tell me it can't be done, and uh, it's just it's it's, it's just wrong. We've got to stop this. And um, you know, when somebody tells you something can't be done, the only thing I hear is that they can't, they don't know how to do it. That's what I'm hearing um, because I can go down the street and see other people in the same in a very similar situation doing it. Um, it's and and I've been in so many situations where I've been told that can't be done, and I say really because you know look at look at those guys over there, they're doing it. And they've been doing it for a while and it's working better than what you're doing. So you might want to rethink your position. Um, but anyways, so yeah, don't, don't listen to, we, we've got to get rid of the peers. It's just not, it's not appropriate. It's just not appropriate. Very true. And it actually speaks against the fundamental values of Agile of continuously learning. So if you say yeah. you can't do it this way, it means you are shutting down on that Agile approach. Thank you yeah. so much. I will be, Getting to the next question, which will be my last question from, from my end. I like it when you, you say 
you can be as agile as a situation that you face, meaning situations differ. It's not one size fits all. I'd just like you to shed more light on how accessible this disciplined agile toolkit is to people. Do they need to subscribe somewhere? Do they just need to click on a website and access it? How does it really work? And could you just shed more light on the wow factor? I, I like the, the wow. Yeah. I would like to hear more on that. And after that, I will roll the ball to my co-host in Chimonia. Over to you, Scott, again. Yeah, so so Discipline Agile is published in a in a range of sources. So there's like I can't really point to here's one source, um, other than maybe like PMI.org. Um, you know, that's certainly a good a good starting point. So um, so on PMI.org, there's the Discipline Agile Hub. Um, so PMI.org slash disciplined hyphen agile, um, and that's that's evolving constantly. But and um, and we've got a, a a reasonable project under just starting up to um, do a revamp of that. Um, but anyway, so there's a lot of good material there, which is always, which is constantly being updated. Um, a, a good source, is, a good starting point is probably either uh, the book um, from PMI Publications, Introduction to Discipline Agile Delivery, written by Mark Lines and myself. And that's a very short book, but it's software focused. And it's about a team starting with Scrum and then evolving into more of a continuous uh, continuous delivery lean approach um, because they became a DevOps organization. Um, so, but that's a good, it's a good short airplane read um, if we ever get to fly in airplanes again. But uh, the, and then there's the Choose Your Wow book and that's a big thick book. It's about 400 pages. And um, as PMI members, you have access to a free copy of that, a free PDF. Um, so just log into PMI.org and, you know, um, log in and do a search for Choose Your Wow and you can download a PDF. Um, or you can purchase either a, like a, a, a Mobi copy or a, a physical copy if you know if you don't like PDFs. Um, so that's a good read. Um, that's also focused on discipline agile delivery, but it goes into the details in for a lot of practices for teams. And many of those practices, you know, the majority of those practices and strategies are actually applicable to non-software teams. So um, sometime this year, I hope to refactor that, and, or my team <laughs> hopes to refactor that, um, and you know, and, and tease out the uh, business-oriented stuff from the from the software-specific stuff. But um, you know, if you just sort of squint at it, you can. You can pretty much see how you know 85 90 percent of it is applicable to generic teams not just software development teams and the so anyway so that's a that's a good source but um of course there's the the basics of da uh, e-learning workshop it's about a six it takes about six out you know five six hours to complete that's a really good um start it's a good introduction to da just to get you some of the basic concepts of choosing your wow and what's that what that's all about uh, and then, of course, there's the certification courses um, for uh, DASM, Discipline Agile Scrum Master, Discipline Agile Senior Scrum Master, and then the upcoming Discipline Agile Coach and Discipline Agile Value Stream Consultant training. So um, we're getting better at publishing. I hope to get a lot more out there this year. Uh, a lot of it will be on PMI.org, and some of it will be, you know, still in courseware, still in um, other like books and public, you know, solid publications, um, I guess you'd call them. Thank you for that highlight, Scott. Um, I'm going to take you back a little bit, uh, just for the sake of the people that join us, um, joined us a little bit late. Um, what is the difference really um, between um, disciplined agile and the different um, other different methodologies like Kanban, XP, and and Scrum, and um, why why DA? Yeah, okay. yeah, great question. So so disciplined agile is a toolkit. We're ba it's basically a superset of XP and Scrum and Lean and, and many, many others. So what we do in DA is we mine those methods for practices and ideas and strategies. So for example, um, all of the XP practices are in DA. All of the Agile modeling practices are there. The Scrum practices are there. Um, the Scrum roles are there. The Some of the Agile modeling roles are there. So um, you know, ideas from the PMBOK guide are there. So what we do, because um, the challenge with a lot of the methods is, that, well, the good thing is they solve a certain problem, you know, so XP solves the, you know, how does a, how does a software development team work in a, in a more disciplined um, and professional manner? Um, Scrum solves the problem of how do you do uh, requirements management? How do you collaborate? How do you, 
How do you time box things? So, you know, it's more of a, a management and leadership of a team thing. And which is great, you know, you know, all great ideas, but all these methods leave it up to you to fill in the blanks, right? So, you know, you'll hear about, you know, Scrum will often say, well, to make Scrum work, you've got to adopt XP. So it's really Scrum plus XP. Um, yeah, um, but you also need some agile modeling techniques, some, you know, some strategies that were popularized by the unified process and a few others, right? Because you got to get the job done. Um, so the methods often leave you to fill in the blanks and um, you know, fill in all the missing stuff. And that's a lot of hard work. Um, so some of the methods is a little bit easier because they're more sophisticated. Um, like extreme programming has a pretty darn good answer to how do you run a software development team. Um, but there's still, there's still a few things missing that you've got to, you've got to tack in for your situation and you know, for whatever year it is you're trying to do. Um, so anyway, so in DA, we do all that heavy lifting for you. And um, we help to put all these strategies into context. We, we help you to even get, to get you to think about, you know, do we need, even need to do them? Because um, earlier I was ranting about the evils of purism. Well, some of the agile purists will tell you we don't need to do governance. Come on, right? Um, <laughs> you're being governed, like it or not. Um, I think you deserve to be governed effectively. I also know that if you leave it to the traditionalists, you won't be governed effectively. So in DA, we explicitly deal with governance issues. And yeah, that's a swear word for some agilists, but the reality is, like I said, you are gonna get governed. So um, I, you, know, you, you know, step up and get, be governed well. Um, at the same time, we, so, so there's these issues, these blind spots that um, people have because of the methods. And the methods will often um, have a certain set of terminology. So Scrum has its terminology and which is fine, right? But then if you only know that terminology, how can you find strategies and ideas from different domains that don't use that, that terminology? So it's actually, a, you're putting blinders on when you limit yourself like that. So we're very careful in DA about terminology. Um, because we've seen significant damage um, for, to people's learning um, in the Agile community because of some of the really goofy terminology. Um, and it was purposely goofy. If you, if you read the, some of the original literature about Scrum, they purposely chose goofy terms to send a message out to the world, a marketing message out to the world that this is different. Uh, and that was a great decision. That was a good thing to do from a marketing point of view from a helping people and, 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 and to be fair, it did sort of, you know, give people a good, you know, kick in the head too. So, to, you know, wake up, man, this is different, pay attention. Um, so that's very helpful, um, but it's also very damaging. So, and this is, and this is part of the DA uh, mindset. We recognize that there is no such, thing, no, no such thing as a best practice. So every given strategy has advantages and disadvantages. And as a result, so it works well for some situations and is phenomenally bad for others. So that decision to change the terminology was very, it had some significant advantages, but it also had some significant different disadvantages that we're suffering from now as a community. Um, so anyway, so we gotta be pretty careful with it. So, and, and what also happens is when you are a little more open-minded and um, dealing with a, a more robust problem than what Scrum wants to deal with, you start to realize, and, and you can see this, you don't, even, you don't even have to listen to me on this. You can just go and observe this in your own organizations. You will have different teams will be working different ways. So some teams will be doing something that looks like Scrum. Other teams will be doing something that looks like Kanban. Fair enough, right? Different teams, different situations work in different ways. Some teams will be doing projects. Some teams will be doing not projects. They'll be like more of a product, you know, long running products team, for example. And that's fine, right? because they're in different situations. So do the right thing for the situation that you're in. But what happens when you choose to observe things like this, when you choose to understand that one size does not fit all and one method is not gonna get the job done for you, what you quickly realize is that you need, you need to look at this bigger picture. You need to support Kanban and you know, Kanban ways of working and Scrum ways of working and other ways of working um, for very good reasons. And, and they have very different terminologies. They have very different um, ways of looking at things in some cases. And we've done the hard work to combine all these things because this is the actual problem that you're dealing with in your organizations. How do we make our organization work? 
It's not, your problem is not how do I adopt Scrum or how do I adopt SAFE? That is not your problem. That is not really the issue. Um, the real issue is how do we become effective across the entire organization and how do we enable people to work effectively and in changing ways um, as their situation changes. So, and so anyway, so the methods, you know, don't get me wrong, you know, the methods are great because um, they solve a certain problem. And, you know, if you've got that certain problem, great, they're a good starting point for you. Um, but you've got to see them as a starting point. Because um, um, Eva Yaxson a couple of years ago for IEEE Software wrote an article um, called, uh, you know, es escaping from method prison or escaping from method jail or something like that. And his, his fundamental point, well, and this is a gentleman that has produced, you know, several methods over his lifetime. Um, his, his, his point was that when you adopt a method, you solve that, you know, if you adopted it well, you solve a certain problem, but then you find yourself in method jail because you hit the limits of the method. And, and the methods don't, the, you know, none of the methods tell you how can I move out of that method, right? How can I abandon you? How can I abandon the method to go do something else? It, that's crazy. None of them do that, right? There's all this marketing and hand-waving that they're flexible, but they never tell you how to move away from them. <laughs> like, geez, that's, that's, that, that's just marketing kiss of death. So yeah, so, so this is the problem. You end, you end up in method jail. So, so anyways, so the methods are great, good starting points, but they're not ending points. Um, they're only a step in your overall learning and improving journey. Um, so, you know, mind them, you know, take advantage of them for what they are. There's great ideas out there, but, um, you know, they're not sufficient for your actual needs. And, and Scott, when it comes to um, working with different teams and uh, using the different um, um, aspects of uh, discipline agile, how do you make sure um, discipline agile is used to its full capacity in terms of transparency? Because it's it's clear that organizations will will use different aspects of it, but how do these organizations make sure discipline agile is used to uh, to its full capacity uh, through transparency? Yeah. So. That it depends is the quick answer, but uh, this is one of the reasons why we're bringing out the uh, particularly the distant agile value stream consultant uh, certification because those people are being trained in exactly that. How do we, you know, um, how do we bring um, bring improvement across the organization? How do we improve the value streams? How do we improve um, into other, you know, it, you know, the collaboration with other parts of the organization? How do we transform the organization and do so, uh, and transform it into a learning organization, not just transform it into like a scrum organization or a safe organization, but into a true learning organization like the apex predators I was talking about earlier. They're learning organizations. That's why they're as good as they are because they choose to learn and to improve and they've got those skills. Um, and DA, our goal in DA is to help you to get those skills. Um, there's also the Dispanagile Consultant or Dispanagile Coach um, uh, certification, sorry. Um, and it's geared for more for a multi-team situation um, or a team coaching situation, but now we're interacting with other teams. So my team is trying to do its thing. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, my team is trying to do whatever it is we're trying to accomplish, but we have to work with finance. To get funding and if we're working in a very agile manner and they're not then how do we interact with them how do we help them to maybe allow us to experiment with a different way of working to a different way of funding our project or funding our team um, how do we get them you know how do we convince them to experiment with different ways of, of governing us from a financial point of view or if i'm working with the enterprise architecture team how do i get them to um, work in a more agile manner, or maybe in a less agile manner, right? So maybe, um, you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm uh, I'm coaching the enterprise architecture team, and are we're trying to work with some so agile software development teams, but they're frankly rather immature, and they don't understand the need, basic needs of you know the organization and the bigger picture, and how to work in a in a mature enterprise manner as opposed to the relatively immature team focused manner. Um, because this is this is actually one of the challenges with the Agile Manifesto. Um, one, well, one of its strengths was that it's team focused. One of its great weaknesses is that it's team focused. Um, so you end up with these these Agile teams that are doing really well for whatever it is that they want that whatever it is that they need to do, but they're not working well with others, and they're not you know you, you know they might be solving a certain problem, but 
it's not, they're not well connected with the rest of the organization. So um, you could have a bunch of really good agile team, like really good agile teams that individually are really good, but then um, together uh, they're, they're not pulling in the same direction. You know, my team's going that way. Your team is going that way. Somebody else's team is going that way. So we're all really awesome at, at going our, in our own ways, but together um, we're not moving anywhere as an organization. Um, and I see that all the time, right? So, um, so as a coach on the enterprise architecture team, one of the remits of the enterprise architecture team is to try to get people sort of going in the same direction. Um, so how the heck do I, how, you know, as a coach, how do I help this really awesome agile team, which is probably being rewarded for their behavior, yet it's not what the organization really needs, right? So um, that is, that's a, that's a big challenge. So anyway, so um, this is what the discipline agile coach is all about. Um, how do I coach outside of the team to teams that might be very different and have very different priorities and, um, and, and focuses than my team does. Um, and, and it's not just about, you know, I'm coaching a software development team. I'm coaching a team, um, might be a software team, might be, might be the finance team, might be the HR team, who knows? Um, but my team, I have to help my team work with disparate, um, other teams that, um, have different views of the universe and have, very, have often very different priorities. I think um, you did touch a little bit on, on, on the Agile yeah. Manifesto, and I do realize uh, Discipline Agile has its own manifesto as well. Um, maybe you can share it like the uh, DA Agile Manifesto as well? Yeah, definitely. So um, a little bit of history. So the, so the Agile Manifesto, as we know, was written 20 years ago. And one of the decisions that was made at the time by the original 17 was that they, if they were, if they're ever going to change the manifesto, all of them had to agree to the changes, right? right? Had to have, it was a consensus decision. Fair enough. It's, it's their work. That's their decision. Like it or not, like you can't, you can't argue. It's right. that's their decision, right? Unfortunately, uh, for various reasons, several of them are adamant they'll never change it, and, and fair enough, right? Because you know, opening it up now would be, or even opening up there, ten years ago, there was actually uh, Alistair Coburn um, ran a uh, ran an event. Where a bunch of us got together to potentially think about evolving it, and it, it was a great conversation. It was a great, great weekend, but it went nowhere because um, like, there's just wildly different views of what needed to evolve. I highly suspect to be the same, you know, even you know another ten years later. But anyways, uh, but people are talking about it, so which is great. It's interesting conversations. So it was around that time that um, we decided. So it was pretty clear to us that the um, Agile Manifesto was never going to change. It was also phenomenally clear to us that it wasn't sufficient, that you know, we were getting into, you know, we had already found problems years ago with the manifesto um, and that we that were really sort of hampering us, um, let alone, um, you, know, what, you know, as we were extend, expanding way beyond software development. So um, in DA, we decided, we made the decision, we're just gonna write our own manifesto, why not? Um, nothing stopping, I, I'm not, you know, constrained by, you know, what. Uh, Kent Beck and everybody else decided. So, you know, good for them. But anyway, so we wrote an extension to the Agile Manifesto. Um, so instead of focusing on software, we focused on solutions. And that's a very important nuance. Um, instead of focusing on uh, working software, we focused on consumable solutions. So, because it's not just sufficient for your, for something to work. Um, it also has to be usable. It also has to be desirable. So you could release working stuff to the marketplace, but if nobody buys it, you've still failed, right? So that basic fundamental point was missing um, in our mind. Plus we you know, extended it to the enterprise. So over, the, over several years, we, we evolved um, the Dispen what we call the Dispen Agile Manifesto and it, was, and it was based on the original Agile Manifesto. And it had values, we added a fifth value and we, ha we added some principles and we reworded re a few things to, to take the bias out of, out of the original manifesto. Um, but then what happened about a year and a half ago, um, we were you know, still evolving it. And at the time we were evolving, uh, where we integrating Flex into the DA toolkit and Flex um, is the work of Al Shalloway and his company and uh, it's all about value streams and how do we, you know, how do we bring value to the customers? And the, so as we were bringing his stuff in, it was pretty darn clear to us that the Dispen Agile Manifesto needed, needed another rewrite. 
Um, so fair enough. So we started working it. And um, we then came very quickly came to the conclusion that the values and principles format of the original manifesto um, just wasn't going to get the job done. So we stepped back and we asked the question, well, what would we do today if you know if we if we were to write them if we were to write a manifesto today, um, and, it's, and this is not a manifesto. This is a, this is describing a mindset. It's not a manifesto because, um, yeah, manifesto is not might not be the best word these days. But anyways, so if you were if we were going to start from scratch, how would we do it? And um, we ended up coming up with what was uh, what became the DA the DA mindset, and it's based on a collection of principles promises and guidelines. Um, so we believe in a collection of principles. We, in order to fulfill these, you know, we, we make promises to ourselves um, and to the people we collaborate with. And in order to fulfill these promises, we follow a collection of guidelines that enable us uh, to do that, to, to do that. So if you, if you go to PMI.org, just do a, just Google, you know, DA mind or disciplinary agile mindset, um, you'll see a, you'll, you'll get to a fairly detailed article on the topic, but um, uh, or read chapter, I think it's chapter two in the, in the Choose Your Wild book, but uh, it's probably chapter two. <laughs> so anyways, um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, so we, we, we chose, chose three things because we're really talking about business agility, but enterprise agility, not just about software development, right? So when you start going beyond, um, uh, beyond that, and as we we're talking about, you know, before, you know, before we kicked off, there are several sessions this month about, you know, potential extensions uh, to the manifesto and how do we rethink things and good stuff like that. So this is a, this has been an active topic for years, um, and and that was actually another reason why another reason why we went away from using the term manifesto was because as soon as you talk about well we extended the Agile manifesto and this is our this is the X Y Z manifesto, then it, all these other people with their versions of the manifesto, all of which are great, they start coming out and they want to argue nuances and all these nitnoid things. It's like, you know, my manifesto could beat up your man manifesto. It's like, I could care less. It's, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, whatever. Um, you know, you know, yeah, good idea, interesting nuance, angels dancing on heads of pins you know, whoop you do, um, you know, so what? Yeah, so, you know, Kent Beck and I years ago argued about um, when Kent added uh, respect um, as a fifth value to XP, um, I had added humility as a fifth value um, about a year before him. And then we, you know, and it was a friendly, argu you know, a friendly argument over beer, of course, but, uh, you know, we, you know, um, we would argue, oh, it's not, you know, it's not, it's really humility. No, it's really respect. No, but, you know, respect comes from humility. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. Um, but any, and, and, and uh, either way, it doesn't really, you know, interesting nuance, good discussion over a beer, who cares, uh, is, is the end result. Um, but because it's based the same, you know, slightly different vision of the same idea. But, um, but anyways, yeah, so it's, um, I think the uh, the manifesto, the Agile manifesto is awesome. Um, it, it was an incredible piece of work um, in its day. It's had a huge effect on uh, on the community, uh, as we as we all know. Um, but um, it's long in the tooth. <laughs> it really is. Um, so yeah, who knows? Maybe maybe some interesting things will come out of uh, these sessions this month. And uh, you know, somebody there'll be a new manifesto at some point. Who knows? Yeah, I, I, I hope so too. And uh, when you talk about mindset, uh, Scott, what really comes to my mind is uh, uh, human capital. And uh, I believe human capital is a, a big aspect of, uh, of, of DA as well. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how would you um, just give insights on um, how DA uh, um, uh, rats around human capital and how how can human capital be uh, a part of all the other all the other uh, methodologies? Yeah, so I think um, agile is certainly hu um, human focused and human centered. You know, whatever you want to call that, um, which is fantastic. Um, this is this is one of the huge benefits um, that the agile manifesto really has has brought um, to the forefront. The um, but one of our, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the seven principles of the DA mindset is to be awesome, to, um, you know, to, you know, build awesome people, to grow awesome people, to have awesome teams, 
uh, people, you know, learning and working together. Um, we want to, you know, we talk about having semi-autonomous teams, uh, you know, building joyful environment. You know, one of the guidelines is to, to build a joyful environment. Um, one of the uh, promises is um, to, you know, to um, have uh, embrace uh, psychological safety and diversity. So it really, and, and there's other people centric uh, ideas there too, but it really is all about the people. Um, for years, we pitched, um, you know, one of our marketing slogans, I guess, was that DA was, was people first. And um, because it really, that really is the situation. It's also um, one of the, one of the, ch one of the challenges. So for those of you who are coming from a more traditional project management um, environment, um, one of the challenges is to become more like really good project managers are people focused. Um, but there are some interesting challenges in the project management mindset that we need to overcome. One of them is the use of the term resource to refer to people. Um, you know, water is a resource, wood, minerals, those are resources. People are people. Um, I don't, most people don't like being compared to a piece of wood. Uh, you know, they just don't. So it's, and, and, and Frank, and one of the challenges to, um, you know, to work more effectively, um, to get these communities working more effectively is um, the, the agilists find it phenomenally offensive, actually, um, to be referred to as, as resources. And um, many managers seem to, are still struggling with that as a concept. And I'm constantly um, harping on this with my, with my colleagues, because um, we have got to get that. We've got to get the resource word out of our out of our vernacular when we refer to people. Um, you know, not you know, you know, not you know, other things. You know, wood, water, you know, cement, whatever. Those are all good. Uh, people, not resources. <laughs> people are people, and um, yeah, it's and and it's really it's really interesting. Um, you know, if you watch, um, you know, say project managers and agiles interact together for the first time. Um, the conversation shuts down as soon as a project manager uses the word resource. It, it, it's really amazing. Like just the, you can watch the bio and go, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, and they, 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 they just, just don't have patience for it anymore. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, so we need, we need to be careful. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's fun. Um, you know, it's a you know, fun challenge sometimes to help overcome, but, but yeah, being, pe being people oriented, absolutely critical, absolutely critical. Thank you, thank you, Scott, for your uh, sharing. And I believe um, we are now getting to the point where we can get questions from the audience. If you have any questions for our guest, Scott Ambler, please um, share them in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself and ask uh, the question right ahead. And uh, Billy, over to you. Thank you so much, Nchimunya. That was an awesome session. Thank you. I'm looking out for raise hands here. You can raise your hand and ask a question by unmuting yourself, or you can alternatively just type into the chat box. This is an open session, and all questions are very welcome. I'm looking in the chat box. I'm uh, not seeing anything there. Is it that we've understood everything? So maybe Scott, as, as people are trying to think what to ask, uh, you can also share on the different certifications that um, the, I know you touched on a few, um, maybe you can shed more light on the different certifications and uh, on, on disciplined agile. Yeah, definitely. So uh, there's four four certifications currently planned. Two of which are available right now. Two uh, two more will be available in a, in a month or two. Um, so the ones that are available right now, the first one is the Discipline Agile Scrum Master, and this is basically for novices. So if you're if you're new to Agile, um, then this is a really good starting point. The because it goes into fundamentals of Agile, Lean, um, fundamentals of DA, basic Scrum stuff. Um, so it's, it's really a, uh, an extension to the CSM in many ways. So where the CSM, you know, we're getting a, a CSM, which is, you know, which is great, um, focuses on scrum, 
we go one step further and we go beyond Scrum. So you get a more robust view of, of how Agile and Lean actually work in practice. The, but we still call it Discipline Agile Scrum Master because this is what the marketplace wants. So like it or not, um, there's a lot of jobs out there for Scrum Masters. And um, so most people want to get a certification that will help, th help lead them to a, another job or to you know you know a better position than what they currently have. So this is you know, we, we we keep getting asked why do we call it Discipline Agile Scrum Master when we go way beyond Scrum? Well, it's because you know marketplace realities. Um, then there's this the Discipline Agile Senior Scrum Master, and this is more of a uh, you know assumes you know uh, that that you get a couple, at least a couple of years of real Agile experience, plus um, you need to. You, 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 you uh, hopefully have taken the DASM or otherwise you, you know, some sort of equivalent, but you've got to have at least two years of, of, uh, of agile experience. And what we teach you there is how to, how to apply the DA toolkit in, in detail and to, um, yeah, and we, you know, really do go beyond, uh, once again, we go beyond agile and lean or we go beyond scrum to cover agile and lean, but also um, you're becoming a junior coach um, by this point in your career, potentially becoming a junior coach. So there's some more people oriented stuff, some more coaching stuff. And, um, but it's really all about, you know, how do we, you know, how do we look at the bigger, how does it all fit together? And, how, you know, how do we look at the bigger picture from a team point of view and from, um, you know, how do we, how do we make better choices and um, good stuff like that. Then the, then there's the Discipline Agile uh, Value Stream Consultant. It is, uh, it's coming out in a couple of months. Its focus is on how do we do tra at, um, uh, discipline agile transformations in organizations and help them become learning organizations. And you'll learn things like, um, you know, how do you, you know, how do you do greenfield improvements? So say you, you haven't really been doing agile at all, or you've you've been doing a little bit, of, you've been experimenting, but you're you know clearly not there yet. Um, then how do you, you know, how do you take it the next steps? Or maybe you're a safe organization or a scrum organization and you sort of hit the limits or you're struggling. Um, or, you know, you're sort of doing it, but, you know, not quite seeing the amazing benefits you'd hope for. And how do you, how do you learn to improve uh, upon that? So, you, so we believe you start where you are, right? So if you're currently a, a safe shop or a scrum shop, well, that's your starting point. And because you're doing safe, um, we have playbooks, improvement playbooks for that, because, you know, you're doing safe. So we, we've got a pretty darn good idea what challenges you're currently facing and struggling with, or you're, you're doing mostly scrum. So we got a pretty good idea what challenges you're facing because of the scrum mindset. Um, so we can help you, we, you know, um, we're developing playbooks for that. We can help you move beyond, uh, you know, beyond where you are and, and actually help you to become, you know, break out of method jail and become a learning organization. So that's, um, uh, that's the idea. And then, and then um, earlier I was talking about the discipline agile coach uh, certification, and that is all about, um, I'm coaching a, a single team or several teams, and now we're interacting with other teams in the organization that are that are different from us, have different points of view, and and yet we still need to interact with them because we're semi-autonomous, right? So one of the great myths in the agile community is that teams are autonomous, and that, that's not really true. If I have to collaborate with another team, I'm not autonomous anymore. Um, and, and that's a good thing. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. That's a good thing uh, because I want to work with that other team in order to do something uh, harder than I could have, that my team could have accomplished by itself probably. So being semi-autonomous can be a, a, a very good thing. So the, so anyway, so how, but how do we do that successfully and how do we um, help other teams evolve because we need to be able, you know, we've got this working agreement with this other team, right? So we need to, these two teams need to figure out how we're going to work together and be effective. And that might mean my team needs to change a bit. And it might mean, might mean that team needs to change a bit so we can sort of meet in the middle somewhere and then evolve from there. So how do you do that? Um, and that, you know, so that's what the DAC is all about. Okay. So Scott, we now have a plethora of questions flowing in the chat box, which is a very great thing. It shows that we are having people engaged. I will start with the first one on top, and I would like if you would give them maybe two minutes each so that we attend to as many questions as we can. The first one is coming from Pira. Would you like to elaborate on the word disciplined? What do you compare it with that seems undisciplined? 
Yeah, definitely. So um, we 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 don't get this question as much anymore, but uh, we certainly used to uh, because some of the marketing rhetoric around agile originally was it's more disciplined than traditional, which was true. Um, that was true um, if you're doing agile properly. But um, the discipline comes in when in the mindset and in the in the in the understanding that you're part of the team. So just understanding that you're that you need to be enterprise aware that my team has to work with others, that we have to do what's right for the organization, not just what's convenient for my team. Having this one to know that you've got choices and that you need to choose the best way of working for you in your situation and not just do what's, what you're told to um, by the process that you're following or by the methodology you've just adopted or the, by the, you know, the, the certification that you've, that's just in, inculcated you into you know, whatever that religion is. It's, it, in many ways, this is, um, a lot of this acid stuff is a bit religious in some ways. Um, and I would invite you to look at the background at some of the, uh, some of the original 17. I'll just leave it at that. But uh, um, anyways, yeah, do a little bit of research sometimes. Uh, but fair enough, right? Fair enough. And, um, you yeah, know, good for them. But the, but yeah, so, so the discipline comes in in looking to bigger picture and in being willing to um, work with others that, might have a very different viewpoint than you, but you still need to work together and, um, and you learn from each other and, and just being respectful. Like, um, you know, I, I keep saying it, that the traditional community has done some great things. They're smart people taking on really hard problems and we can leverage some of that great thinking and some of those great ideas if we choose to. It's not the evil, you know, those evil traditionalists that we've been told. Um, uh, they really aren't. So we can learn from them. Okay. Thank you, Peter, for that response. I am sure that Peter is happy with the answer. I saw the thumbs up. We now move on to the next question from Melin. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. The question is, do we have to have years of months of experience to get the first step into Agile certification? And in this sense, I'm assuming it's DA certification because there are many other Agile certifications out there. So if you could just focus on the DA. Yeah, so, uh, so Discipline Agile Scrum Master requires no Agile experience whatsoever. So my 10-year-old daughter could get it, um, maybe. But uh, yeah, certainly she'd be qualified to at least try. Um, yeah, so DASM requires no experience. The other certifications do. Um, and, and we expect you to earn the certification. You're not just buying the certifications. Some, some Agile certifications you just buy, you, you, know, you pretty much buy. Um, you, know, you gotta earn it, you gotta pass tests and pay attention. And, Stuff like that. So um, pass hard tests. Um, I, I want I want to point that out. Um, we ha we've had an issue with some already certified agile certified people from agile other schemes that get surprised by it's a being it, that it's a hard test. Um, we also get uh, we've also run into some PMPs that think the test isn't hard enough. So um, I think that's a good problem. But anyways, uh, yeah, it's a slightly harder test than you're probably used to if you've got other agile certs. Thank you very much. I should actually move on to trying the DA. Uh, I, I recently got the ACP certification. I will be going on to the DA okay. as my next stop. Yeah. We yeah. have a question from we have a question from Nana who asks, what is your take on how Agile can be more widely adopted and scaled up across Africa? Yeah, so I think it, it, it's just a matter of um, a, a constant drumbeat. So having you know, regular conversations with people, you know, sharing your experiences, sharing your uh, wins, also sharing your losses, but also um, helping people to understand uh, that you know, Agile, uh, it, it, in some ways it's a marketing thing, right? Like you know, sharing case studies, sharing experiences, um, and also being open to bringing people in and having conversations and, 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 and policing the purists um, so I, I think it's better for Africa because we've learned, the Azure community has learned, uh, particularly in North America, that the purists um, didn't help as much as they were thinking they were helping. Um, so I think we've got, you know, you've now got a, a, a bigger base from, of, of experience from which to, to grow. But I think it's, um, it really is this issue of um, just marketing and communication and, and making sure that people understand this is real, it's here to stay. It's been around for a long time now. And uh, it, you know, even though it might be new to some people, um, it's, it's been around for a long time and it's not going anywhere. Um, 
that is very clearly uh, not ever going to disappear. So, uh, you know, just help people, you know, help educate people. And, and, and a lot of the time too, people get confused because they hear the purists or they hear all the, all the talk about software development and nothing about construction or nothing about, you know, finance or, you know, whatever it is that they're interested in. And you've got to help them understand, well, yes, you know, it's a lot of software stuff, but um, there's also non-software stuff. So in our workshops, we purposely have non-software, you know, we have some software stuff, of course, but um, some of our exercises are, have nothing to do with software at all. Um, and I, I think now every, every single one starts with non-software stuff. If not, it soon will, um, because I've been, I've been laying down the law on that one. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, but clearly like all of our DA workshops have uh, non-software exercises um, and rightfully so. And certainly the DA coach one will be mostly non-software because it's going into the entire organization, so. Thank you very much. If there's one thing that I'm excited about in this session is that I got Mylin names correct and it has been confirmed in the chat box. <laughs> On that note, I would like to combine two questions for you so that you have a go at it. Most of them are just statements. I like dear people love it. They love the way you've articulated. They want to do more with DA. The question coming from Venom is, could I be right to look at disciplined agile as a composite of what I see as good elements from the many other methodologies? So just hold the thought there. That's the number one. The other one is coming from Peter again, who says, I have some experience with portfolio safe and see lots of good things and some not so good. What is your take on Seth? I think yeah. I will pose those two questions. Yeah, so it's clearly a, um, DA is clearly a composite of um, great ideas from a very wide range of sources. And it's a hybrid um, because we, we really wanna help you to work smarter and in your situation. So there's some great ideas in SAFE. We've adopted um, ideas from SAFE. Um, SAFE has certainly adopted ideas um, that were in DA uh, or in other sources as well. Um, it would have been nice to get a little bit of credit for some of that, but uh, anyways, um, you know, big room planning, for example, is an agile modeling technique from almost 20 years ago. But uh, anyways, um, that's okay. Doesn't matter. And to be fair, uh, agile agile modeling sessions were. Uh, really a lean technique uh, called Obaya rooms, uh, but or at least the room agile modeling rooms were are Obaya rooms from like 20 years before that. Um, so yeah, and we all adopt great ideas from a wide range of sources, and that's that's good news. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's some there's some great ideas, good and bad in in uh, in safe, um, but then it too. So and I really hate to say the word bad, and because it's really the real issue is not appropriate for your situation, right? So what yeah, so you're in a situation, whatever your situation is, it's great. Some of those techniques in SAFE or in DA and others will be, will be really good ideas for you right now. Others will be just obviously bad. That is just not going to work for you. That doesn't mean that it's an inherently bad idea. It just means it's not appropriate for you. Um, because, you know, somebody else, uh, Vernon, for example, um, Vernon might be in a situation where that technique that's really bad for you is the best thing for him, uh, for his team, because of, you know, whatever situation they're in. So, um, context counts is, is the answer on that one. I think um, Billy must have missed a, a question or two. And I'm just going to go back to Mylin and uh, Nana. Mylin says, I just got my uh, CAPM because I wasn't qualified to get a PMP designation due to lack of work experience. Tried many years to get project work experience, but no one will give me a chance. What do you advise because someone wants a work experience, but how can we get there when we look for it and no one is giving us a chance, a chance to get to get that work experience? A vision yeah. yeah, that's so maybe a Comment on that. Yeah, that, that getting bootstrapping is always hard and um, luckily with the CAPM, you, sh you should have a better chance now of getting in a position where you can get some real project experience, like as a, as a junior PM or as a, uh, as, a, as a project control officer, perhaps, or something, um, because, you know, you've now gotten the education 
of like fundament, you know, the fundamentals of, of project management. And, um, and in many ways, the, the CAPM is not that much easier to get than the PMP because like, the, you know, the P, PMP requires uh, what, two, um, several thousand hours of work experience and, and proof of it and, and good stuff like that. Um, but it's hard to get the CAPM. And uh, so good, uh, you know, congratulations. That's a, that's a, that's a, a, a valid, uh, you know, valid thing to do. Um, I would hope that would open some doors for you. Um, if not, then uh, what I would suggest is, uh, so certainly PMI has um, job boards and stuff like that going. I'm, frankly, I just go into you know, LinkedIn, but it's, um, uh, and something, uh, you know, the, the chat, now this is um, one thing chapters can start doing, and I, and I appreciate that um, this is a reason we do chapter, is helping connect employers to em potential employees. And this is one of the reasons why um, the chapters exist. Now it's a little bit harder in the, you know, in COVID times, but, um, uh, and it's also hard because I think a lot of, a lot of employees are sort of locked down on uh, new hires at the present moment. It's, it's certainly like that in North America. Um, I, I, I don't know about, uh, about Africa, but I would suspect it's similar. Um, so yeah, this is, I think it's just a hard time. Um, and, and I would say the exact same thing for, for, for people with Agile, um, you know, trying to get into Agile as well. It's just um, companies have sort of locked down on hiring, I think. So the next one is looking at your experience and what you know about Agile, what should Africa focus on right now? Yeah, so there's, there's a lot of infrastructure work going on in Africa, as you know. Um, there's a lot of great software development work too. So, you know, I always hate to, talk, to focus on software, but uh, even though I'm a software guy, but the, uh, there's fantastic stuff going on. Um, but, but if you just like look at like telecom infrastructure work, road infrastructure work, railways, um, I was working in South Africa a couple of years ago um, you know, talking with uh, a railway organization and a telecom organization, there's just fantastic um, amounts of work that needs to be done over the next few decades. Um, just as the you know, as the various countries um, you know ramp up and uh, you know start really you know focusing on on building up their building up the country. So I think there's a lot of good stuff going on there. Um, I think agile. So one of the things I like to distinguish between tangible products, you know, where you're working with atoms. So you're like, you're building houses and bridges and railways and stuff like that. And intangible projects where you're working with bits, where, you know, you're working with information, right? So you're building software, you're, you know, you're doing movies, you're, you know, creating information basically. Um, and those have, those types of projects have different sets of behaviors. Um, but the, so one of the things you'll want to do is focus. Um, you might want to, you might want to specialize on either tangible or intangible just in general, um, because your behaviors and skills will need to be different. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, certainly, certainly there's a lot of good opportunity and frankly, um, startups, um, you know, create your own job. Uh, is, I've got a young daughter and, uh, one of the, I'm constantly tr thinking through what the heck is my, you know, my daughter going to do. And what should I, you know, help her learn? And one of the one of the one of the things is going to uh, one thing is to be agile. And like, luckily, she's very collaborative, um, so that's not a big deal. But the basic project management skills, I think, um, are going to be critical for her as she gets older. And flexibility, and uh, I think the ability to create your own job, and to uh, certainly uh, at least be prepared to do that at all points in time. Uh, so. You know, general answers, I guess, but uh, certainly uh, some good things are happening. I think. Right. So I'll take the other question from Venon. Could I be right to look at Discipline Agile as a composite of what I see as good elements from the many other methodologies? Yeah, I answered that earlier. The answer is yes. Yeah. Um, I have another one from... Peter, I have some experience with the uh, portfolio that's safe and see it, lots of good things and some not so good. What is your take on safe? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. Uh, I sort of answered that earlier too. That was well, the, uh, yeah, there's great ideas. So all these, and I would, 
And it's, this is not just to save things. So let's turn this into, in the, in the, in the, rework this question to be the PMBOK guide. Um, there's great ideas in the PMBOK guide and we've leveraged them and we continue to uh, mine that. Uh, we've actually got a, an effort underway um, within my team um, to mine some of the great ideas and the various uh, standards and guidelines um, uh, from you know, the legacy standards and guidelines that we have. Because um, the governance, uh, we have a, a governance uh, uh, portfolio program and, and project um, governance uh, standard, which is phenomenal. Uh, when I first read that, I, I, you know, when, I, when I first went to go read that, I thought, oh man, um, I bet you this is going to be a mess. And it wasn't. It was fan, like it was leading a lot of leading edge, really good ideas. I'm, I'm not convinced people are doing them, but um, certainly uh, the ideas are there if you choose to actually, you know, read them and understand what what what's being said. And uh, and the risk manage, the risk management guide uh, or practice guide and and uh, others, um, a lot of great ideas there. So and we're mining all those, right? So just like we mine ideas out of safe and out of less and you know, out of the PMBOK guide and, and many other sources. Um, we just want to put things in a, in a context. So um, there's you know, a bunch of great ideas from a very wide range of sources. Thank you so much. Maybe I should just jump in there, yep. if I may. Thank you, Nchumun. I, uh, I just want to mention that quickly, we have a link in the, in the chat box. We don't want to lose the line of thought. We would like you to re register there as an attendance sheet. Should you have further questions, we'll link you up with Scott and we'll send all the questions and we can assure you we'll get you all the answers and all the pointers to the resources. Yeah. Before I call back in Chimonia, I have a, a question that I've seen in the chat, which resonates with myself. I am PMP and SCP certified as well. And the issue of getting PDUs is one area that is not easy, but we get it done anyway, and we accrue PDUs. Is it a similar method that PMI is using on DA? And what I recently noticed is that when I get PDUs for my PMP, they're also accredited to the ACP. So I don't have to work double. Wow, how does the DA work? Do you have to accrue PDUs or you get the certification in perpetuity? Yeah, um, you have to accrue PDUs. So the um, we're in the process of PMI of putting some new systems in place. So there's a few things that are still a little bit clunky. Um, so um, now having said that, you'll see like compared to say six months ago, um, you know, the accrual of PDUs is a heck of a lot easier. So as you said, you know, you're, you're getting credit in two places and right in, without having to do double data entry and stuff like that. So things are, are getting a lot better. The, um, and it's the same sort of thing in, in DA. So one of the things that we're doing is we are, we are asking for um, a handful of PDUs every year. I believe it's seven PDUs each year. Whereas if I'm not mistaken, the PMP asks for 30 PDUs every three years. Now, I highly suspect um, so we're experimenting with this annual PDU thing um, in DA. Well, from PMP, from PMI's point of view, this is an experiment. From my point of view, this is the way we always did it. So, um, but what we're going to see is our, our, our feeling is that it will be easier for people to um, collect PDUs if they need to do seven, 10 a year, as opposed to 30 every year. Because a lot of people will leave it to the last minute and then they scramble to get 30 PDUs, which is hard. Um, you know, that's pretty hard to do if you've left it to the last one. My, my wife was, was a PMP for several decades and um, I distinctly remember her having to scramble sometimes. But anyways, so whereas it's not as much of a scramble uh, for, for DA because it's a smaller number each year. Now the, um, but as well, and, we're, and we're, we're doing our best to make it easier for chapters to uh, give PDU, so you can you know, the chapter can uh, get a, a unique PDU code that people can use to get credit for this event and, and or similar events as well. Um, and I'm sure that'll be more and more automated over the years. But um, but yeah, I, my money, you know, I, I don't know for sure, uh, but I I would guess that we will probably go to like 10 PDUs every year at some point because um, I think they we're learning that the annual number of P. So I think we need more than seven PDUs for DA. That would be my guess. Um, and I think 
I think we're learning pretty quickly that an, an annual PDU count is better than a, a, you know every three years. So, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. And maybe it'll be like you know two years. You know we'll you know meet in the middle somehow. But um, we'll figure it out. Uh, but we're experimenting right now. And, and that's, this is agile, right? This is what you do. You you put something out there. You measure it. You do. We're effectively doing A/B testing right now, right? So we have some certs three years, some certs one year. Uh, we'll run them for a while, measure, see what's what. Fantastic. I, I like how you are proposing getting PDUs in, in increments. This is totally agile. Thank you so much, Scott. Yeah, it, it, it's so much easier, right? And, and, it, and it forces the issue. This is why we did it in DA. So originally, the DA organization borrowed a lot of ideas from the PMI certification process because we looked around and it was one of the more respectable certifications in the world. We looked at a lot and you know, certainly PMP was, was really well done. Um, and there was a few things we wanted to tweak, one of which was the, you know, the three-year thing. Um, so we did, right? So, um, and it worked pretty well because it, it motivates people to continually learn um, is the, the short story. And, and it avoids the scramble, um, you know, because uh, that's not fun. If you've ever if you've ever done that, that is not generally not fun. Thank you very much. We could go on and on because this is really very good material coming through and something that we can apply it even at personal level. This is what I love about Agile. I've applied Agile in many unconventional ways. And I would like all of you attending this session or listening to this recording to take everything and make sure that you continuously learn. We are going to bring this to an end here. And as I mentioned, we're going to get all the questions that will follow up, we'll collect them and send them over to you, Scott. Okay. On behalf of PMI Chapter Zambia, I would like to profoundly thank you for your time from your busy schedule. I see you everywhere. And I was wondering how you're going to manage to attend this. I should get on the pew that you get. Excellent job. Thank you so much for your dedication and the passion. We are very grateful. This is going to be stored as an asset for PMI Zambi chapter. And I hope your doors will be open for further engagements because this is something that is just building up and it's new. There will be a lot of questions and we would like to get back to you and get more information to just get our people, get the value out of the membership because we believe in offering quality chapter experience in PMI Zambia chapter. On behalf of the board, I really want to thank you. I really want to thank Agile 20 Festival in Chimunya, our ambassador, for coming together and putting this together. Thank you so much. And now hand over to Nchimunya. Job well done. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for attending this event. And uh, from the uh, festival perspective, I would like to thank everybody. Thank you so much, Scott, for sharing your knowledge and uh, sharing it with everybody that that attended. So unfortunately, good things come to an end. So this is the end of our session. And may you continue attending the other sessions that are part of the Agile 20 Reflect Festival. So let's keep enjoying. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you very, very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.